welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. We're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to get down on my knees and let's honor the Lord and go before the Lord and invite the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. Father, we would come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus, giving you thanks and praise for all that you are, all that you've done, all that you're going to do. Holy Spirit, we welcome you and invite you to come and be our teacher, be our guide tonight, Lord. Reveal to us what's inside of our hearts, God, from what's inside of your word, Lord, and correct us, change us. Give us the vision and the direction that each and every one of us need for our individual lives. Pray, Father, that as we open up your word tonight, God, that you would open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. You may produce something in all of our lives together. Father, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, but also we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, we love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than anybody, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Father. Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated and get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 tonight. And tonight I've got a, a little message called relational risk. Seems that people are trying not to risk anything anymore. I don't know if you get that impression, but as I talk to people and as I interact with different individuals and as I listen to the news and see what's going on in our nation, it seems like there's a lot less risk these days. People have lost too much, people have been hurt too bad, and they feel like they've learned their lesson, so they don't want to risk anything. Now, in the area of relationships, it's no different. We've been burned by bad relationships. Uh, I, I think everybody in this room could say, yeah, I've been, I've been burned a couple of times maybe, a couple, three, four times. And, and therefore, we don't want to risk anything in our relationships. And yet God is a God who when I see what he does in the Bible, I have to stop and wonder, my goodness, was that risky? What is it that what God was doing? What is it that God is saying? Here's a God who puts it all on the line. Here's a God who takes on the form of flesh, weakness, goes and lives a life among people. I mean, how risky is that? Here's a God who put it all on the line. Why? For relationship. God didn't want legalism. He didn't want the law. He didn't want us going to hell. And therefore, God put it all on the line, gave the ultimate sacrifice for you and I, risking it all. And now he entrusts to us his word. He entrusts to us those same relationships. And if we're going to have relationships in the kingdom of God, it's going to be a bit risky. We're going to run the risk of getting burned again and again. But we're told to risk it. I find that the great men and women of God in the Bible risked things for relationships, put themselves on the line, spent money, spent time, spent effort, went the extra mile. Even Jesus said, you know, that if somebody's compelling you to go a mile, go the extra mile. And so you and I have to learn something, especially looking upon a weekend like we are this weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. We're looking at barbecues, friends, family. We're, we're going to be in these natural things called relationships. And, and, and there's going to be some risk to take this weekend. Going to be some things facing us as we go out into the parks and maybe into the backyard, go out by the pool or whatever it is that you're going to be doing in the next 24 hours. God is asking you to be aware that there is something that he says in his word, and there are some principles that we can take a look at tonight, and we can see how we're to behave and how we're supposed to act and and what we can do spiritually as well as naturally, some very practical things that we're going to take a look at tonight. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, are you there? All right, I'm glad that one of you is. How about the rest of you guys? Are you there tonight, 2 Timothy chapter 4? We're going to start reading in verse number 9. The apostle Paul's writing his last words to Timothy. And in verse number 9, he says, Be diligent to come to me quickly. Verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me. There's that being burnt already right off the bat. He's asking Timothy to come. Why? Because somebody burned him. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Verse number 11, Only Luke is with me. 
Get Mark and bring him here with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Verse number 12, and Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Verse 13, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Verse number 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Second burn. My goodness. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Verse 15, you also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. I believe that God takes the men and women of the Bible and he pulls out the magnifying glass for you and I and places it close to their lives for a reason. Here's the reason. Because he wants us to examine what's going on in their lives. And as we take a look at the example of the lives of the men and women of God in the Bible, it's not just a history lesson. This is not just their story. This is his story. His story, hello, God's story. God was doing something. God was showing us something by the example of their lives. And as we get a hold of what was taking place and what was going on in the life of the Apostle Paul here, we can find out some principles that we can put into place in our lives that will guide our relationships. A couple of things tonight that we're going to take a look at. Godly principles that guide relationships. A couple of things that we're going to take a look at. Number one is that we are to stand with the godly. How many of you were here this morning? Okay, a bunch of you guys were here this morning. For those of you that were not here this morning, the last point of the message from this morning was that we have to, if we're going to keep a, a heart that's open to the things of God, if we're going to keep a spiritual heart, an pliable heart, a flexibility with God, that we are to watch out where we stand. Really, that was talking about our relationships, talking about people that we're either going to stand with or we're not going to stand with them. And so we've got to watch out that we're standing with the godly. Very important for you and I. That if we're going to guide our relationships in a godly way, that we have to stand with the godly. Why? Because who you hang around is who you will become. Here the Apostle Paul is saying, be diligent to come to me quickly. He wanted Timothy with him. And the reason why he wanted him with him is because Timothy was like-minded with Paul. He was of a similar faith. Timothy, he, he called Timothy his son in the faith. How many of you know the son acts like, looks like, does things like the father? And so here Paul is saying, I need somebody godly to be hanging out with me. Why? Because these other guys that love the world have departed from me. And there's even somebody that was doing me much harm. And so I need somebody to come and stand by my side. Somebody that I know isn't going to do me harm. Somebody I know is going to encourage me. Somebody I know is going to bless me. Somebody who I, I know is trustworthy. And so if you're going to live a godly life and have godly relationships, you've got to make sure that you stand with the godly. Sometimes you might be all alone. Everybody's deserted you. That's when it's time to call a brother up. Hello? Call somebody up that you know is godly and say, hey, can you come and stand with me? Everybody's deserted me. They all turned their backs on me. Listen, and I need somebody. I need some encouragement because the world is calling, but that's why I'm calling you. Are you listening tonight? That's why we have 10, count them, 10 church services a week here. Why? Because church is, yes, to sing praises to God, to worship God, to, 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 to hear the word of God. But also, hopefully, you've recognized and realized that we are all creatures of habit. We all sit in the same spot in the sanctuary, right? We have claimed it, placed our flag, that is my seat, Right? Some of you have placed it in a way that when you see someone else sitting there, you're almost like territorial about it. You know, like that's my seat. But I'll let you have it just for tonight. But next week, there is plenty of seats all around my seat that you can, you can use. You know, the men, they, they, they normally will sit, you know, a, a seat apart from each other. They need their man space. And in the middle of that man space is the demilitarized zone that you don't cross over. That's like the NATO area. You know, there's just nothing going on in it. No fly zone. No, no nothing goes on in there. You know, you just, you got your man space. Okay. I, I can see some of you guys out there got your man space tonight. Hallelujah. They're, they're all waving their hankies over there at me. Praise God. <laughs> but that's why we have so many church services getting back to the point. I forgot what I was talking. No, I'm just kidding. Well, that's why we have so many church services here is because you may be sitting in the same spot, but guess what? The people next to you have been sitting in the same spot too. Time to reach out. Time to find out what's your name. What do you do? Do you have family? 
Where do you live? What do you like? You know, get to know the people around you. Start to reach out. Start to get into godly relationships. Because you know what? If the world has beat you up and you don't have any friends out there in the world, there are some people in this church who are godly and who will stand with you in the day of your trial. <laughs> Amen. You know, we've got prayer teams up here standing up at the altar after every service. Why? Because sometimes you just need somebody to agree with you. Need somebody to stand with you. Need somebody to lock up hands and say, let's believe God for this. Let, let's go after God for this. We want to make sure that, that, that we're in agreement and we're praying the will of God in your life. We want to see the goodness of God in your life. Going through a trial, but guess what? God's not finished with you yet. God's got great things ahead of you. And we can start to encourage and build people up. Love what it says in uh, Psalm chapter 1, starting in verse number 1. If you want to put your finger in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, turn me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 1, starting in verse number 1, we're talking about standing with the godly. Psalm 1, verse number 1 starts out like this. It says, blessed. Everybody say Blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, take a look at this, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Verse number two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So notice, he, he says, blessed. Somebody who is happy, highly to be favored, somebody who's going to be successful, somebody who has the capacity to succeed. The blessing of God is on their life. Why? Because they do not listen to the words of the ungodly. They don't listen to the counsel of the ungodly, nor do they stand in the way of the sinners. They don't group up with the sinful people and stand with those people. No, they get away from that. Nor do they sit in the seat of the scornful, but their delight is in. They stand in where? The law of the Lord, and in it they meditate day and night. Now look at verse number five, drop down. Therefore the ungodly shall not do what? Oh, I'm sorry, they shall not do what? They shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. See, when you choose to stand with the godly, just by nature of the fact that you are standing on the right side, now all of a sudden the sinners will not stand in those areas. They cannot stand in the judgment. And that's why Jesus says, pray that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Why? Because when you stand with the godly, you're standing on the right side. You're on the right team. Now all of a sudden you've got people, they got your back. And even more importantly than that, God's got your back. See, I, I've noticed... In the short time I've been on the planet, that people come and people go. Are, are, are you in agreement with that? People come. People will come into your life. Some people for a season. Some people, you know, their they're, they're season's short. Some people have a long season. Some people are lifelong friends. Very rarely do you find lifelong friends. But people come and people go. This morning I was drinking a juice drink. And I looked at the bottle and it said, shake well, separation occurs naturally. See, right there I was like, Lord, you're speaking to me about tonight's message. We got to stir ourselves up. We got to get out of our funk. You know what I mean when I say funk, right? You ever been in a blue funk where you just feel down, you feel discouraged, you feel... No, that's when it's time to go stand with the godly. Shake yourself up. Why? Because separation occurs naturally. You got to get in with the righteous. You got to get in with the godly. You got to get in with the people of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every day we need to stir ourselves up to stand with the godly in his ways. See, that, that's why the man was blessed because he meditated in the law of the Lord day and night. Praise God. Number one thing, godly principles that guide relationships that we see there in 2 Timothy is that we are to stand with the godly. Second thing for tonight is that we got to understand pain and forgiveness. I'll describe what that means in a second, but we have to understand pain and forgiveness. If you don't understand pain, you're going to just lock up. You're going to insulate yourself from pain and you're going to isolate yourself from other people. But also, you got to understand forgiveness. Sometimes, we'll get into this in a little bit, but sometimes we take forgiveness as, i got to be a doormat. 
And if you don't understand pain and forgiveness, you're not going to have godly principles that guide your relationships. Let me, let me describe it to you like this. Often in our lives, the pain of the process we go through is well worth the product in the end. I'll say that again, okay? I know, I know I used a lot of words that started with the letter P. Often the pain of the process that we have to go through is worth the product in the end. One more time. Often the pain of the process we go through is worth the product in the end. In other words, can I say it to you like this? Take the risk. Here's why it's worth it. Are you going to get hurt? Yes. I'll tell you that right now. Some of my best friends are the ones who have hurt me the most. But the fact that I went through the pain of the process, I now enjoy the product of a relationship that's godly. Are you listening? We as Christians have to grow up and learn that not everything on earth in our lifetime here on the planet is about our comfort and our easy existence. That when we go through adversity, when we go through trials, when we go through pain, it produces something in our life. And the pain of the process is worth the product. That's why when you go through the pain of a trial and it produces character and patience and endurance in your life, it's worth it in the end. Any bodybuilder will tell you that if you're going to grow muscle and you're going to be strong, you're going to have to go through some pain of ripping your muscles in order to be fought. Hello. So the pain of the process in relationships is that you have to understand that your friends are going to hurt your feelings. It's not always going to be nice. It's not always going to be the way that you wanted it to be. They're not going to always think like you do. Anybody found that out even in marriage? I mean, that's just part of Relationships 101 is that, is that you take two people and you have them try and do life together and they're going to disagree. I love how I think it was C.S. Lewis said it. He said, if you took the whole universe and you took one little pebble, the, what are the odds of me wanting to place that pebble in the same place you want to put it? See, we can't even decide on something as small and minute as where to put something. So what makes us think that relationships are going to be easy? But if we understand that there is a pain that we've got to go through to get into a process, it's going to produce godly results in our lives. Are you there in 2 Timothy? Uh, hold your finger there once again and go with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 15. Are you still with me tonight? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 15, great chapter in the Bible. Turning point in the church. As a matter of fact, we're going to go to the end of Acts chapter number 15 because the Apostle Paul, after all this stuff went down in Acts chapter 15, he wants to go back and start encouraging the churches once again that they've started. Go and see how they're doing. So he talks to his buddy. Acts chapter 15, he talks to his friend, verse number 36. Acts chapter 15, verse number 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. In other words, he says, hey, Barnabas, you know what? We planted a lot of churches. Let's go see how they're doing. Let's go encourage them. Man, I'm excited to see what God's doing in those churches. So take a look at the next verse, verse 37. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Now, if you don't know who John called Mark, Mark is, he was a young man that Paul had had with them on a missionary journey before. And John called Mark had left Paul high and dry in a time of need. There was some pain that John called Mark had caused Paul. And take a look at what happens in verse number 38. But Paul insisted, so Barnabas was determined, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. 
He says, no, this little boy deserted us. When he saw hard work, he ran the other way. And I'm not doing that again. I'm not going through that pain again. I, 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 I insist, if he's going, I'm not going. Now, take a look at what happens. Verse 39. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And it goes on, verse 40, but Paul chose Silas and departed. What happened? They divided over this issue. Here's Paul and Barnabas, the preaching team that went about on missionary journeys, starting churches, two amazing men of God. But look at what happens once again in verse number 39. It says that Barnabas took Mark, right? Barnabas took Mark. Did you know that earlier in the book of Acts, Barnabas took Paul? I'm going somewhere with this in a second, okay? Earlier in the book of Acts, Barnabas heard about Paul, who was formerly Saul, the terrorist of the church, the one who had been persecuting the church, and Barnabas went and took Paul and brought him to Antioch. And there they stayed. Now, Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas' name is. So here's this man that took Paul and he encouraged him. And Paul became this great apostle, this great man of God, this great missionary, right? Now we find Barnabas took Mark. This son of encouragement got a hold of this young man, and he took him with him. And he said, hey, I know what happened. Hey, I, I know you messed up. I know you failed. But listen, you can do it. And this son of encouragement started to pour himself into this young man, Mark, started to, started to just pour into him, started to encourage him. I love what our pastor often says. People will only go as far as they are encouraged. And later on in, in the Apostle Paul's life, we find something out. We find out that this young man was so encouraged that now Paul's attitude about him has changed. You still got your finger there in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Turn back there with me, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Take a look at verse number 11. Only Luke is with me. Get who? I, I'm sorry. There was about three or four of you out there that, that responded. Who is Paul asking him to get? One more time because that was still a weak response. Look up on the overhead if you don't have it yet. Only Luke is with me. Get who? Mark. Mark. That, that's John called Mark. That, that's the same one that abandoned them. That's the same one who left them high and dry, but it's also the same one that Barnabas took. And now here the apostle Paul is saying, get Mark and bring him with you. Why? For he is useful to me for ministry. In other words, this throwaway kid... That even Paul had said, uh-uh, no, I'm not going through that pain again. Now, what's he say? Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Because somebody poured encouragement, because somebody went through the pain of the process, now they're reaping the benefit of the product. Are you listening today? Now, pain in a relationship may not be a bad thing either. Okay, I want you to go somewhere with me. Pain in a relationship may not be a bad thing either. If someone is a true friend, they should be able to tell you when you're wrong. I had a weak amen on that one. Let me try that again, okay? Rewind. If someone is a true friend, they should be able to tell you when you're wrong. Amen. I thank God for the people who have come and confronted me in my life. I know for a fact that God placed me in a relationship with my wife and that my wife is there if for nothing else. I'm just kidding. No, but my wife can come and she can tell me. She can jam me up. Why? Because she knows me better than anybody else. And she can get in my face and she is a pistol. And she can, I mean, just total fireball and she will just tell you're wrong. You are wrong. And I thank God for that. Why? Because I hear the voice of the Lord coming through my beautiful wife. And I love her. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that he's put someone like that in my life. But if you can't go and confront someone and tell them that they're wrong, are you really their friend? 
Think about that for a second. If you can't go and tell somebody that they're wrong, are you really their friend? Are you really operating in the love of God? The Bible says that we should love each other enough to speak the truth. That we are to speak the truth in love. That it's not a mean-spirited, ha ha, you're wrong. No, that's not what this is about. This is about us loving each other and not wanting to see people go down the wrong path. And so when we see those attitudes, when we see those actions, when we see those things in our brothers and sisters, we should go and we should tell them. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. In other words, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you love them, you respect them, and they come and they hurt you, that's okay. Get over it. You need to understand pain. And you need to understand forgiveness. If you understand those things, then they can come and they can tell you anything. They can open up. They can, they can reveal things to you. You can reveal things to them. You can share your heart with them and trust that even if they hurt you, it's okay. Why? Because faithful are the wounds of a friend. They're not hurting you on purpose. And even if they are mean-spirited, you can get over it and you can forgive them if there's true love and true forgiveness and they're willing to change in the future. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. We'll talk about this. Talk a little bit more about forgiveness in a moment. I like what uh, his name is Henry Ward Beecher. He said, every man should have a fair-sized cemetery in which to bury the faults of his friends. I thought that was cool. See, because if you can forgive people when they hurt you, intentionally, unintentionally, hey, you know what? We're going to operate in the love of God and operate with the forgiveness of God. It's buried. It's gone. It's dead. It's in the past. I love you, and let's move forward. Praise God. So, godly principles that guide relationships. Number one is that we are to stand with the godly. Number two is that we are to understand pain and forgiveness. Final thing that we see there in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 is that we are to beware of harmful people. Now, I mentioned that sometimes people view forgiveness as a doormat. You know, oh, go ahead, hurt me. You know, all right, it's okay. Everybody else does. Go ahead. Come on. Shove the knife in right about here, you know. And, and, and people get the wrong attitude about Christians that we are just supposed to lay down and, and let everybody wipe their filth all over us in our relationships and, and that we're just supposed to say thank you, go ahead and do it again. No. What I see in the Word of God is different than that. I see when people really have a true heart for God and they want to move forward with God, then we can forgive, we can love, and we can move on. But if people are being harmful, then we are to take a different approach with those people. Let's take a look at it in the Word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hopefully you got your finger there still or you're there right now. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse number 14. The Apostle Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Notice he's naming this guy. He's calling this guy out by name. And, and just in case you got the wrong Alexander, this is the coppersmith. All right? Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. Notice the word harm. There's a difference between hurt. You can get hurt by somebody. Or you can be harmed by somebody. There is a difference there. We were just talking about pain. Pain can be caused by hurt, but there's a difference between being hurt by somebody and being harmed by someone. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Notice he just gives it to God right there. He says, I, I, I'm not after this guy. I'm not going to harm him back. God is the one who's going to settle accounts. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so it's not our job to go after people. You know, vengeance is a dish served cold. No, get off that, okay? Get on to God. Get your mind renewed to the things of God. But look at verse 15. He says, you must also beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. What is their words? Well, it's the word of God. These are preachers. Think about it. This is the Apostle Paul. What's the Apostle Paul speaking about? He's speaking about Jesus. Timothy's a pastor. What's Timothy speaking about? Well, he's speaking about Jesus. So here's somebody who's coming against their words or their preaching, their teaching, their doctrine, the word of God that's coming out of their mouths. He's resisting them and he's doing Paul harm. Paul says, I'm not going to go try and harm him back. I'm going to give him over to the Lord. But Timothy, look out for this guy. You beware of him. Don't let him harm you. 
Sometimes we say, you know, as Christians, we should forgive. We should be loving to all. We think it means being weak and stupid. God has not called us to be weak and stupid. He's called us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And where we are weak, he is strong. And he's not called us to be stupid. He's called us to be harmless, 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 harmless as doves, but wise as a serpent, right? That means that we are not to cause harm to other people. That prayer of Jabez, oh Lord, that I may not cause harm, that I may not cause pain to other people. We're not out to do that, but we want to be a blessing instead. That means that offense and sin is under the blood. But people who are disobedient, divisive, and damaging are to be avoided. Let me say that again, okay? This is the difference between hurt and harm. Sometimes we can get hurt by offenses. Sometimes we can get hurt by the sins of others. But offense and sin are under the blood. If you just say, hey, Lord, that's under the blood of Jesus... Right then and there, it's taken care of, it's forgiveness, it's the will of God. But people who are disobedient to the word of God, remember he said he's resisting our words. What does that mean? He's coming against the word of God. People who are disobedient, people who are divisive, who are going to try and separate you from godly relationships. People who are going to try and take you away from soundness of speech and mind and the word of God. Those divisive people and damaging people, those people that cause harm are to be avoided. Let's take a look at it. You're there in 2 Timothy. Already you saw that Timothy was to beware of him, to avoid him. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. A couple pages back, past 1 Timothy, you'll find 2 Thessalonians, right at the end of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So we saw that the damaging are to be avoided because this... Alexander the coppersmith was doing harm, so he said, beware of him. What about the disobedience? Second Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse 14 and 15 says these words. It says, that if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle. Now, we know from the word of God that when the apostle Paul wrote these letters, Peter said that there were people who distort Paul's writings as they do the other scriptures. So this is not just Paul writing. This is the Holy Spirit breathing the inspired word of God, speaking the word of God. And so now he says, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, in other words, if they're not obedient to the word of God, take a look at this. Note that person. Okay? Note that person. Mark that person. And look at this. And do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Wow. That means if somebody is being disobedient to the word of God and you know about it, you take note and you don't hang out. Why? So that they'll be ashamed. This is is not me telling you to be mean to anybody. This is not me telling you to harm anybody. This is me telling you to do the word of God. Now, lest I leave you there and you start secluding yourself from everybody, take a look at the next verse. Yet do not count him as an enemy. See, sometimes we get a hold of the word of God, we get a hold of one scripture, and we say, oh, I got this. And and, no, listen, you messed up, that's it, you're cut off, right, and they're gone. You're out of my life. I've deleted you from my phone. I have unfriended you on Facebook and unfollowed you on Twitter. Be gone. But it says, don't count him an enemy. Look at this, but admonish him as a brother. In other words, if you're going to separate yourself from somebody that you've noted as being disobedient to the word of God, you have a responsibility now to go to them and say, hey, listen, as long as you're doing what you're doing, we ain't hanging out. But when you're ready to obey the word of God, come on back. See, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, he told the Corinthians, hey, what's this sexual immorality I'm hearing about? The guy sleeping with his dad. I mean, this is just crazy. Kick that guy out. Hand him over to Satan that he may learn not to blaspheme. Right? Then then 2 Corinthians, they were so zealous and and they cast him out. 2 Corinthians, he comes back. He says, hey, time out. He repented. Let them back in. Okay? So that's the attitude we're supposed to have towards the disobedient. As, and, and we're supposed to go to them and not treat them as an enemy. No, we don't, we don't cut people off like that. No, we go and we tell them, hey, listen, as long as you're going to be disobedient to the word, we're not going to hang out. But when you're ready to obey the word of God, 
we'll talk, okay? We'll come back. We'll restore this thing. That's how that's supposed to work, okay? Last verse for tonight, Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, go past First and Second Timothy to the book of Titus. Third chapter, last chapter in Titus. Towards the end of Titus chapter 3. So we talked about the damaging. We talked about the disobedient. What about the divisive? What about those divisive people? Titus chapter 3, verse 10, says these words. It says reject. Everybody say reject. reject. Now we just talked about noting somebody and separating yourself from them, but admonishing them, right? Now it comes along in Titus chapter 3, verse 10. It says reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. So... When you find somebody that's divisive, what does that mean, divisive? If you look up this word in the Greek, it can be literally translated as if you find a heretic. Now, what is a heretic? Okay, we, we've called people names and we've used that name probably. Thought it was funny but didn't really know what it means. A heretic is somebody who has taken a stand and chosen a side. And that side is doctrinally against the word of God. So a heretic, somebody who has taken a stand, and their stand is not with the godly, but their stand is with the ungodly. He says, warn them once, warn them twice, and then reject them. That's it. If they're not going to listen to you, they're gone. You cut them off. Had somebody approach me one time and try and start talking to me about a certain subject, the doctrinal subject, and, and they kind of approached me in a weird way, and, and so I responded, I said, I don't really know what you're talking about. Can you clarify that for me? And so they started breaking out scriptures, and, and so I responded, very kind, okay, well, you know, this is what the Word of God has to say. And they came back at me, and I went, okay, there's one. And so I responded very kindly once again, and I said, okay, you know, this is what I see about the Word of God, and let me ask you some questions about this. Why does this take place? And here, here's several witnesses, not just two or three, here's like six, out of the Word of God, and, and how is it that you don't see that? And they came back at me once again. And I said, I'm ending this conversation right now. We're done. We're not talking anymore. You are cut off. They came back and they said, you've been defeated by me. You know what I did? I said, may the Lord repay him according to his word. No, I'm just, I just said, hey, we're done. No response. Cut off. You're done, dude. I'm not, I'm not fooling around. I'm not messing with that stuff. You've obviously taken a stand against sound teaching, sound biblical teaching from the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And if that's the stand you're going to take, then I'm not standing with you, bro. We're done. So a couple of things that we learned tonight. Godly principles that guide relationships. Number one is that we are to stand with the godly. Surround yourself with godly people. Second thing is that we are to understand pain and forgiveness. Hopefully that helps some of you guys in here tonight. That if you can understand pain and, and, and maybe in relationships you can go through the pain of the process, that you can reap the benefit of the product in your life. And finally, forgiveness, that, that we're not to be a doormat, we're not to just allow people to, to mess us all up, but we are to take those sins and those offenses that come against us and put them under the blood of Jesus. Third thing tonight is that we are to beware of harmful people. If they're damaging, avoid them. If they're disobedient, hey, separate yourself, but admonish them. Don't, don't treat them as an enemy. And if they're devices one or two times, then that's it. All right? If you got something from the, from the word of the Lord tonight... Give God a great big praise. <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's doing some good things here at The Rock. I want to mention to you one of the great things that's coming up next month is that we're going to have the Back to School Bash. Go into the inner city for those of you that don't know what a Back to School Bash is. We go into the inner city, into Paris Hill Park, and we provide backpacks for kids who wouldn't have school supplies or backpacks otherwise. Families are impoverished. You know, San Bernardino is... Uh, Second most impoverished city behind Detroit. That's, that's just startling because Detroit is a much larger city than we are, and yet here we are at number two. And so what we do is we reach out and we provide these backpacks. This backpack is filled, it's heavy actually, with school supplies, notebooks, pens, papers, erasers, pencils, rulers, all that kind of stuff. It costs us 20 bucks to fill up a bag like this, and then we go and we distribute thousands of backpacks to the kids in the inner city. Not for our kids. This is an outreach to the community to let them know that we love them, that God loves them, 
that we care about their physical needs as well as their spiritual needs. And so this is a great way that we reach out. If you would like to help us, if you want to join us, and you've got that Saturday afternoon free, then uh, we have a table out there that you can go and sign up. Maybe you've got an artistic gift and you'd like to do some face painting or you just are an able-bodied person. You'd like to help just throw some backpacks around, hand them to different people, that sort of a thing. You can volunteer with us. Uh, but also, let's say you can't come on Saturday, but you just have a heart to give and you want to go throw down an extra 20, 40, 60, 90. Do I hear 100? No, I'm just playing. But um, anyways, if, if you got some extra dough, uh, you can throw down out there. We would love for you to join up with us in that way and provide a backpack and, and, and reach out to the community. So whatever you can do, go visit the table right after church service tonight. Praise God. I want to talk to you guys before I let you go. You guys have been great tonight. I really believe that you got something from God. You know, we've sang together. We experienced the presence of the Lord, and some of you guys got healed. It's just awesome. It's a wonderful time in the presence of God. I believe you got something from the Word. You guys were great. Thank you for letting me speak that into your lives, and I, I really believe that you guys got some encouragement from the Word of God. But it would be a tragedy if we stopped right there and let you go right now. Because if you walked out of this place and your heart wasn't right with God, you died. You wouldn't go to heaven you'd end up in hell. That's, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that hell is a very real place. I know a lot of people these days are saying, well, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's convenient. Do you know that just because you say you don't believe in something doesn't make it non-existent? That's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Well, you can go out on the slow lane of the freeway saying that. You're going to meet one face-to-face -face eventually. Just because you say something isn't real doesn't make it non-existent. The Bible talks about hell talks about heaven as well. And I want to make sure tonight that you end up in heaven when it's all over here on the earth for you and not end up in hell. So I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Here's the question. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? I don't think anybody wants to go to hell or thinks they're going to hell. If, if you think that, then we'll take care of that in a moment. But what makes you think you're going to heaven? Some of you might have answered that and said, well, I think I'm going to heaven because all roads lead to heaven. You know, uh, God's loving and, and kind and uh, wants everybody to be with him. So it doesn't matter what way you live. You find God your way. I'll find God my way. We'll all get there some way. Well, listen, nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon. You'd have to get there one way. Jesus Christ came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except by me. That means that I can't get there your way. You can't get there my way. We can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who breathed the planets into existence, the one who carried out the plan of redemption here on the earth in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, and went to the cross, don't you think that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in the scripture. Sometimes people at that point say, well, that's, that's great, Pastor, because I know I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a good person. You know, I used to be bad, did some bad stuff in my life, but I, I changed and I was good, and I know God lets good people into heaven. Or maybe you've been a good person your entire life, and you say, I'm going to go to heaven because I've been really, really good. I've been nice to my neighbors, helped people out, gave my money to charities, and therefore I'm going to heaven because God lets good people into heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you've been good. I don't see any grading scale in the Bible, any curve that you have to be above in order to get in. God doesn't just let good people into heaven. There's going to be a lot of good people, according to the world's standards, that end up in hell. And listen, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth and not play games. If you think you're going to get to heaven just by being good, you're not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, okay, I understand that, but you know, not only have I been good, but I've also been raised in church. My parents took me to church as a child. Took me to religious classes like catechism, Sunday school, maybe Sabbath school class. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck and had you baptized or christened as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven and denying hell. Right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church, raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that says America is the Christian nation and everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. It's love you enough to tell you the truth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're not some other religion 
that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. Come on tonight, let's talk. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Some of you might say, well, you know, not only when I was a child did I go to church, but I've been in, in church all the time. I mean, here I am sitting in front of you in church tonight, Pastor. Doesn't that make me a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm sitting in church tonight. That's great. I'm glad you're here. Glad you attend church. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? Could you show me where it says just sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Any more than you can go sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Doesn't matter how many times you say it, how long you stay there, you're still going to be a crazy person sitting in your garage. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Some of you might be saying, okay, well, I understand that principle, and I'm not a crazy person. But listen, I, I got involved in my last church. My last church, I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible. I made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Wonderful. I'm glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where it says you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. Or you get a membership card to a church. You get to go to heaven. Listen, God's not looking for your membership card at the gates of heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get involved in church, help out, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Now, some of you might be saying at this point, ah, I got you on this one. Somebody told me that if I know God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Easter, the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. And, 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 and I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament, tell you stories out of the Bible. That's great. Once again, ha have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They know who he is. But they're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you can see him quoting scriptures in the Word of God, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. You know what that tells me? Everybody look up at me for a second. That tells me that it doesn't matter what you have in your head. It is not about mental ascent towards God or having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, being born again. They've raked it through the coals. But again, this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, here's what being born again means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. This is an all-or-nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you in Revelation, the third chapter, last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, here's what it is. A little bit in, a little bit out. A little bit up, a little bit down. Occasional church attendance, a little token prayer every now and then. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. You're not going to make it. How do I know? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, here's the real question. Have you given God all of your heart? And have you given God all of your life? If not, then I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. But let's not leave you there tonight because Jesus went to the cross so that you could give him all of your heart and life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying hell. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Here's your opportunity. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang! Just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to lift your hands. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Now, at this point, you might be saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out, Pastor. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. But get over it. Why? Because think about this for a second. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity in hell? Come on. 
Tonight, you can give God all of your heart and all of your life in this safe and friendly place, even if you're embarrassed. It's better than ending up in hell. So tonight, who should raise their hand? Well, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go, all on the, all the count three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. God bless you. You guys can put your hands down. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's four wise people already. Anybody else on this side? Real quick. So everybody that needed to get right with God was right here. Come on. Let's go for God tonight. There's four wise people already, and I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. That's you. Go ahead. Is that a hand back there? No? All right. All right. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. Come on. Come on. Let's go for God tonight. Let's go for God. If that's you, just be bold and raise it up. If you're sitting there wondering, should I do this? Let me answer the question for you. You should. Go for it. If you're wondering, is he talking to me? I'm talking to you. Come on, go for it. If that's you, you were thinking that. God just told on you. God just spoke to you. Come on, now respond to the Lord. Come on, there's, I, I believe by the Spirit of God, there's four more of you. You got four already. There's four more of you that need to get right with God. Come on, let's go for God tonight. Where are you at? Number five. You just need to get right with God. If that's you, when I'm looking in your direction, raise up your hand. Anybody else? Real quick, come on. Come on, where are you at? Number five, just pop it up. Pop it up. Go for it. Anybody else? Come on, if that's you. Where are they at? Two hands up. Thank you, number five. Number six back there. Where are you at, number seven? Come on. Come on. I got you there. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Number seven up there. Thank you, number seven. And is there a number eight up there too? No? Somewhere over here. They're pointing over here. Number eight. Thank you. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo. Praise God so excited for you guys. Here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. You're number nine, you're number 10. You should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, listen, you didn't miss out just yet. In a moment, we're all going to stand and give a clap and a shout as we do. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand, you should have raised your hand. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. You just come on down. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. You come. Just as you are. Come on, come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. From the family rooms, you want to bring your kids, you can bring your kids. Come on. Come and see. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. Hey, everybody up front. Thank God you guys have come. It's okay. You can stand to your feet. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? You put a smile on your face. God loves you so much. I love you guys, and I'm just excited for what's ahead of you in your new walk with God. Right over here to my right is Pastor Dave in the brown coat. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? Are they going to do weird stuff? Listen, he's cool. It's all good, okay? Pastor Dave's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance. Number one thing he's going to do is pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a godly friend. We were talking about godly relationships tonight. We're going to help you get started with that by giving you somebody that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Just like a physical trainer at the gym does, spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's free, okay? You said you're going to give God all your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Now let us help you with a godly relationship to come alongside you and help you to get strong, all right? You guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave. Let's give them a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.